Software Engineering Radio, Episode 30, Architecture Part 3. Okay, welcome to episode, uh, I don't know which episode, but it's actually the third part of the architecture uh, series of episodes in Software Engineering Radio. Um, in the last episode on software architecture, we talked about the different quality attributes uh, of which you have to strike a compromise when building a software system. Um, in this episode, we want to show you some of the basic tools that you as the architect have available when building software and also um, show some of the relationships of those uh, basic techniques to the quality attributes we introduced in the preceding architecture episode. And by the way, it's again uh, Markus and Michael doing this episode. <laughs> um, and as last time, we decided that we'll do it only in, in, in a pair without Alexander because finding uh, a time slot where the three of us have time is impossible. So, um, so architecture, as we uh, probably mentioned before, is basically um, not something that's formal, but it's rather based on heuristics. And Michael, you probably want to uh, elaborate somewhat on this topic. Yeah, unfortunately, there's really no formal rules or things like that for a developer when he um, architects or designs a piece of software. It's much more based on, on experience, of what has been working uh, before by others and uh, by the, the person himself. Uh, to a large extent, to, to me at least, it's also gut feeling. At some point in time, you don't really think so so hard anymore about it, and you just know uh, well for this kind of job, you you just need, for example, a pipes and fillers design because otherwise um, it, it just doesn't make sense. So so it, this this experience gets then like uh, intrinsic and in, into your daily actions and decisions. Um, to read about uh, what worked for others. Um, there are patterns and, and the whole literature about software architecture and patterns is a, is a great source of uh, resources and, and experience. And we'll put some of those links into our show notes. Um, before we go into detail, just one, one last introductory thing. If architecture is based on heuristics and experience, then as a kind of reverse consequence, what you have to do is obviously you have to test your architecture uh, early on. Like if you have your uh, a gut feeling that says, if I do it this way, it's going to be scalable, then it's probably good for your job position, and <laughs> for your resume, uh, and probably also for your stomach um, to, uh, to make sure you test that early in the development. In the preparation of this episode, uh, Marcus, you uh, showed a special kind of basic mechanisms of architectures, basic properties of software architectures. What are those? So the basic mechanisms that you have available as an architect or as a developer when building a system is basically uh, four. Uh, it's separation, abstraction, compression, and sharing. And um, we'll elaborate on each of them in some detail and then also uh, take a look at a couple of derived um, mechanisms. Um, they then uh, have terms like coupling and uh, you probably cohesion, know some of those cohesion. Information hiding. Right. But we'll come to that later. Right. So let's start with the basic mechanisms of software architecture. Uh, and, and again, just to mention, it's not about the basic means of how you as an architect, you know, coordinate a team and, and stuff. It's really about technically building the system. So um, I guess I'll, I'll do the first one, right? Is that okay for you? That's all right. Okay. Um, so the first one is separation, also known as locality. And um, the idea is that you put a specific functionality into a distinct module or artifact and you give it a well-defined interface. So if you do that, then this obviously simplifies changes to that functionality because the implementation is hidden behind a well-defined interface which hopefully doesn't change it also enhances your chances for reuse because if you have a piece of functionality or a responsibility as people often say modularized into a specific artifact or component or whatever then um, it's easy to reuse that 
well-defined piece of functionality, at least in theory. We all know that reuse is kind of the holy grail. <laughs> Um, it also helps to decompose complex problems because you can solve sub-problems in separate yeah, modules or whatever and then uh, solve the more complex problems by reusing or using the solutions and the modularized solutions for the smaller problems. It also simplifies parallel development because different people can define uh, different artifacts and only communicate through their well-defined interface. Um, a negative consequence is that it might decrease performance um, because you have indirections in the system and it also might uh, cause problems with regards to uh, teamwork because if you have many different parts of your system uh, isolated from each other then you probably have different sub-teams and communication between those teams is often somewhat of a problem. So if we consider how separation influences the quality attributes, then um, it increases maintainability because you separate things into separate modules. It also increased, increases the reusability. We explained that in a, before why. Portability is also increased because you might have a separate module that captures all the specifics of a platform and by exchanging that one, you can port to another uh, environment. Actually, this is called the microkernel architectural pattern and we'll discuss architectural pattern in a future episode. Testability is also increased because you can test each of those well-defined modules separately. Scalability might be increased um, because you can separate or exchange some of the uh, modules with more scalable or with modules that are more suitable for the changing environments. And as we said, it might decrease performance. So let's take a look at a number of uh, uh, examples for separation. One is, of course, in procedural programming, um, you have sub-programs, sub-functions, sub-procedures. Um, the name, parameters, and return type are the interface, and you can call those uh, sub-programs or procedures from various locations, and you can reuse them. In object-oriented programming, we have classes. The whole point of classes is being that they are a module of functionality, a piece of responsibility. And uh, obviously the operations, um, and if you really want to do this, the data structures define the interface, is typically the operations, the public operations define the interface. The implementations, implementation is typically private. Another uh, way of separating things is components. And of course, nobody knows what a component is. But uh, <laughs> for our purposes, we say that a component is a piece of well-defined functionality that exposes this functionality through a well-defined interface and also specifies the dependencies, so the interfaces it uses um, as part of its contract. Uh, a fourth example is aspect orientation. What you do there is that you take things that are not modularizable with the means that I explained before, like subprograms, classes, and components, uh, and separate those out into what people call aspects, and then you take some infrastructure, typically called an aspect weaver, um, to weave in those separated aspects into your base program. And again, that's something where we already had the interview with Gregor Kichales, and also it's a topic that we'll cover in more detail uh, in the future. The second basic mechanism is uh, abstraction. And abstraction in, in general is about hiding details. It's about modeling. It's about uh, well, removing uh, details and, and hiding them. It's uh, about a more general view of a problem that is factored out and just leaves uh, out leaves some details for later resolution. Um, the basic consequences of that that is basic that it simplifies uh, client programming that uh, um, the users of a certain artifact uh, don't have to worry about all the configuration. Uh, and parameter passing uh, details that it basically can provide a simplified uh, programming model for clients. Uh, also, it enhances the chances for reuse. If things are simpler, if there are not so many details exposed, the chance for reuse uh, is larger. Further, it helps to understand uh, complex problems. It, it be, Because it hides complexity, um, it, it makes things easier to understand and, uh, as I just mentioned, easier to reuse, easier to grasp uh, as a developer. Uh, 
But uh, on the other hand, hiding things introduces another layer of interaction. Um, this is uh, funny. Another layer of interaction. Somebody said all the pattern, all the what patterns are about is uh, just another layer of interaction. Well, I don't think that's uh, true, but to, for some patterns, it's it's the point. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, regarding the relationships to the quality attributes, uh, of course, uh, hiding complexity, hiding details improves maintainability because the, the implementer of that artifact can then later change the details without the clients uh, noticing that. Uh, same thing for reusability, um, for portability. Uh, usability, we just uh, discussed uh, that it's an uh, easier programming model typically, um, that for example, uh, applying the facade pattern, uh, you can hide a complex API, you can hide configuration complexities and make things simpler, um, but uh, performance is, is really, uh, there's a negative impact there. Examples uh, of abstraction uh, include inheritance and superclasses where a client can work with a reference to a superclass and, and he just doesn't have to care about the concrete class. So inheritance and superclasses are, are one example and here um, the client typically has to know only the superclass and the subclasses then implement all the details of which you could have actually multiple um, implementations, for example, using the strategy pattern where you would have then multiple implementations of the same interface. Generosity or uh, C++ uh, templates is also something where you abstract an algorithm and leave out the details of the data type. Another example is uh, the factory pattern where you would delegate the responsibility to create, configure, lump together the component uh, to the factory, abstract from the creation details. Right, and, and another abstraction example is domain-specific languages, right? So, uh, in this case, you, you identify a certain viewpoint uh, with regards to your system, and then you only describe those aspects of the system that are relevant to that viewpoint in the DSL, and then you use the usual means we talked about in the model-driven development episodes to to uh, create a runnable system from that. So domain-specific languages uh, are also a very powerful way of abstracting out details. The next uh, basic tool of the architect is compression, which is basically the opposite of separation. The idea is uh, instead of separating things from each other and having separate modules with separate interfaces, you join certain things. This obviously increases the performance um, because you have less or fewer uh, uh, layers of indirection. It might it might speed up the development time. That depends a little bit. Um, the point is, of course, if you create a lot of chaos because you can't separate things nicely, then your development time will only be sped up in the first couple of weeks and maintainability will go down. Um, and, of course, it increases the accidental complexity. Accidental complexity, accidental complexity is a term that says that there is complexity that you could avoid if you would... Uh, organize your system in a more suitable way as opposed to inherent complexity which is basically a consequence of your functional requirements. So uh, examples for compression is for example inlining. If your compiler removes function calls and directly copies the function body to the call side then a level of indirection is removed and um, your performance will increase and we have the other negative consequences. Of course, in case of compiler inlining, you don't care because the bytecode or the generated machine code is not something you, you care about as long as it's fast. Another way is macros and some forms of generic programming, specifically uh, C++ templates, where macros directly replace source code by other pieces of source code. Again, instead of uh, calling things indirectly. So macros are could be called could be considered to be some kind of source level inlining. Um, other examples could, for example, be if you have a nice database layer using, for example, Hibernate that abstracts all kinds of details from your database and uh, makes things portable. You can exchange things. It does your object relational mapping. And of course, sometimes the performance you get from that approach is not good enough, and you might embed uh, SQL code directly in your source code. 
of course, a lot of negative consequences, but the performance might increase because you compress a lot of different levels of indirection and you can get better database performance. Um, compression is something, and that is really important, that should be done automatically because uh, otherwise um, the disadvantages usually become too um, uh, problematic. And also compression is typically used as a means to improve the performance of a system. And as we all know, uh, premature uh, performance uh, optimization is a bad thing. So you should only optimize for performance once you actually measured that there is a performance problem at a certain location in your code. And that as a consequence means that you should compress things only if you can't, uh, if, if you notice that compression will improve performance. The last uh, basic mechanism that we want to discuss is uh, resource sharing. And uh, resource sharing is when you encapsulate uh, data or services centrally with an uh, associated resource manager. Um, basically share you resources uh, among multiple uh, clients that access them to either communicate or trigger each other. Uh, the consequences here are the, the increased uh, consistency in your system, of course having, uh, some th having a central resource uh, that's easier than to align multiple uh, distributed resources, but of course that also decreases performance uh, because it's very easy to um, design a bottleneck in your system. The relationships to the quality attributes are as follows. Integrability is uh, improved because you have a central point where you can uh, configure your system. You have a central pool of resources, for example, uh, where you can do the optimizations. Maintainability is improved. You don't have to um, address multiple resources, multiple locations, but you have a central um, location where you can do the maintenance. Uh, performance, as we just discussed, uh, is impacted negatively. Um, some examples here uh, include pooling uh, patterns, for example, thread or, or memory pools. Uh, yeah, we talked about that in the resource management episode. Exactly, uh, and also singletons. But singletons are uh, in most cases bad, so I don't elaborate on that. Um, then the the next thing that is very typical that are these are uh, blackboards and databases, um, so called also uh, shared data repositories where all clients, all system components would access those uh, resources to uh, get their configuration, to get the shared state information from. And the last one, our servers in typical client-server interaction systems, where the servers offer central resources, uh, central services to all involved clients. Right, and, and just to reiterate on that, um, if you have multiple clients accessing a shared resource concurrently, you're getting into all those problems with locking. And we talked about that in the concurrency episodes. Or Michael, do you want to uh, mention two words on that one? Yeah, here uh, there are some typical patterns on, on how to avoid that. For example, the monitor pattern uh, is the easiest one. Just lock everything on, on every operation. Uh, as soon as a client enters it so that you ensure that only one client operates in your central resource. But with that, of course, you you have the, the, the strongest uh, liabilities here and it's typically quite inefficient. So there are more advanced uh, topics, but uh, please listen to the concurrency episodes. Uh, they, will, they had discussed it in the past and they will discuss it in the future even more. Right. So after those basic mechanisms, we'll now take a look at some of the derived mechanisms that are probably a bit more uh, well known with regards to the terms we use. Those are uh, decomposition and delegation, information hiding, decoupling and separation of concerns. Um, right, so um, you want to start? Yeah, decomposition, it's uh, the, the basic or another term here is um, divide and conquer something uh, very elementary in, in computer science. Uh, 
that uh, you have a problem, you have an algorithm and you separate it into smaller problems um, and you delegate uh, your sub-problems into uh, sub-components, you, you separate your problem into multiple ones. This is based on uh, separation and abstraction as the basic mechanisms and here you have your um, responsibility that you associate with multiple implementation artifacts. And the classical okay. examples are procedural decomposition, strategy pattern, OO in general, the things we all know. The next one, uh, also well known, is information hiding. Uh, it basically says that clients can only see some aspect of the artifact and other artifacts are hidden. It's also based on separation and abstraction. And of course, the idea is that the clients depend only on those public, on the visible uh, aspects or parts, and the private parts can be changed without the clients noticing. The coupling between the clients and the provider is obviously reduced. So again, um, the most well-known example for this thing is classes. Classes have a number of, typically a number of private attributes, private operations, as well as a number of public um, operations which form the interface. And of course, you can also separate the interface out even more uh, by explicitly defining an interface, depending on whether your technology allows you to define interfaces. And also, um, some of the things we mentioned before, abstract classes, factory, strategy pattern, again, are ways of hiding certain aspects. <clears throat> For example, the aspect of which implementation is used or in, a, in a certain uh, context, which implementation of a strategy is used in a certain context. The next item is uh, decoupling and as we all know coupling is bad for maintenance reasons. Um, coupling two responsibilities that actually don't belong together, that, that aren't the same responsibility, just induce, introduces complexity uh, which we can avoid. Uh, so decoupling tries to reduce the dependencies among the responsibilities, assuming the responsibilities are then encapsulated in individual classes and, and components. And usually an interface, uh, at least uh, the interface and its implementation are separated. Um, but here we also discuss about general responsibilities having then them separated uh, into individual artifacts. Uh, this is based on uh, separation and abstraction as basic mechanisms and typical implementation examples here uh, include delegation or strategy, uh, factory and but to me also the, the general um, architectural work of, of decoupling, identifying uh, responsibilities, checking whether they depend on each other, whether they have to depend on each other, and then decoupling those uh, responsibilities into separate subsystems, classes, components, uh, whatever is relevant in, in your context. Right, and, and the way you typically do that is that by uh, identifying the responsibilities you have to take care of in your system and then group together those responsibilities which, you know, interact a lot with each other and decouple those others which have fewer interactions. That's probably the, 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 core, the core idea here. Yeah, a great model for that uh, are the glass responsibility collaboration, short as the CRC cards uh, right. method. Um, I think that it was introduced by Ward Cunningham, yes, right? Yes, I think so. Uh, the first time, and there's a nice paper um, where we put the reference into the show note, uh, which explains on how how to work with CRC cards, and to me that is true architecture because I don't have to th I don't think about technology I don't think so a whole lot about interfaces and communication and data I just think about responsibilities pure responsibilities collaborations giving good names for those responsibilities moving th them around till till you get a uh, uh, the gut feeling that this is just right, how the responsibilities <laughs> are said. Well, the gut feeling, you can also measure, you should minimize the dependencies yep. and you should uh, decouple them where necessary and, and put things together where they belong together. That's actually very interesting because what you talk about is something that I like to call functional architecture, where you really take 
the uh, set of responsibilities of a system and assign them to classes or components or whatever. Uh, the other kind of architecture is what people often call the technical architecture, um, where the problem is more um, now um, you have solved the functional architecture, how do you get it uh, solve all your illities, right? So how do you technically build your system so that it performs well or so that it scales well or so that it's maintainable? And um, sometimes you have to make compromises with regards to your um, functional architecture. If you have uh, distributed your responsibilities nicely and you, you see that things are distributed and therefore slow, then you might have, might have to change things. Um, I think you agree, Michael, that, that for us it's really important to distinguish also the conceptual architecture and the technological realization. Right, that that at least. And what you just described, I, I would suggest a two-step approach here. First, the functional architecture, then try to come up with an ideal technical architecture, but then soon map the, the functional architecture to the technical architecture, and then think about the technologies that you right. uh, might use to implement your, your architecture. Something I really like to ramble about is that if you go to conferences or, or talk to people and talk about architecture, people very often come up with things like, oh, you know, we have this web service-based architecture, or we have this EJB architecture, and people always talk about technologies instead of concepts, instead of saying, hey, we have a, an architecture which uses a component model with those properties, as well as an asynchronous communication based on XML or whatever. People always talk about technology. That's really annoying. Yeah, true. And we'll have a, another episode on this thing in the future. <laughs> So next is separation of concerns, Marcus. Yeah, I think that's also the last one. Um, so the idea is that you separate common and reusable parts of the system that can be implemented generically, which is often some of the technical architecture concerns, into some kind of reusable asset that is later integrated with the functional concerns, which implements the concrete appli appli application. The, the kind of typical example for this thing is the application server. The application server in an in, in enterprise system takes, systems takes care about, um, you know, transactions, security, persistence, uh, all that stuff, um, scalability to some extent. And um, the application server provides these things as services that you can use um, as an application developer and you don't have to re-implement them. And um, uh, the consequences of using this thing is that uh, the technical concerns can be implemented once and can be reused, and the developers of the functional concerns, uh, the thing we just talked about before, you know, with the CLC cards and stuff, don't have to care about the technical concerns too much. Um, I think this is really a very important thing. Application servers and frameworks are one way to tackle it. Uh, aspect orientation is another one. Model-driven development is yet another one where you uh, describe your uh, functional um, requirements or actually the functional algorithms, your, 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 your application logic in, in some kinds of models and then you have generators that generate code in a way that uh, implements the non-functional requirements too. Okay, I think this kind of uh, concludes this episode. Michael, anything else you want to say or, or some outlook you want to give on, on the subsequent architecture episodes? So uh, the next uh, episode on, on software architecture will cover the topics on architectural styles and patterns. Right, and another episode after that one will take care of how to uh, kind of mm, make sure an architecture is uh, followed and implemented uh, consistently in uh, large teams and large systems. And then even further in the future, we'll take a look at product lines. So this finishes this episode. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Software Engineering Radio. If you want to get more information about Software Engineering Radio or if you want to give us feedback, please go to our website at se-radio.net. You can also contact the team at team at se-radio.net, although we prefer entries in our comments system on the website so other people can see what you think. <laughs>
Software Engineering Radio wants to thank Henning Pauli for the intro and outro music, as well as Lipson for providing the bandwidth. This episode of SE Radio, as well as all other episodes, is licensed under Creative Commons license. See the Software Engineering Radio website for details. <laughs>